Welcome. Thank you for joining me once again as we journey through the Gospel of Matthew. We're in one of the greatest teaching sections of, uh, of Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, as we break down these smaller sections, I want to keep reminding you to keep the bigger picture in mind, that this is a, an entire sermon, Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7. And we're just getting into chapter 5, and uh, there's some very interesting things that Jesus has to say. Let's get into the text. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said to people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. We tend to think of Jesus' teaching as, you know, nice things like love one another. This is a rather confrontational and extremely controversial within his time period and remains so today. Let's break it down a little bit. We need to remember the Mosaic Law is an expression of the nature and the, the character of who God is, of what he's all about. And as you look through the law of Moses, the, the Deuteronomic law there, it, it's talking about things about relationships. It's all about building community and doing things that help the community to grow, building relationships. And anything that would cause destruction to the community or destruction to the relationship is considered a sin. And so that's what's going on as we, as we walk through some of these things. They may sound a little strange, but you have to remember the, the foundation is about building community, building relationships. When Jesus is going through this section, he is expounding on his statement, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This statement would have had to have been a shocking, controversial statement. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were considered to be the, the standard of, of, of their religion, the, the proper behavior. Uh, the, and, and if you don't believe me, you could ask the Pharisees and Sages. They would tell you we are the standard. They, they were quite arrogant and, and very uh, ostentatious about their religiosity. And so when Jesus makes this statement, it had to shock the crowd that was listening to him. What does that mean? A righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And if we don't have it, we will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That should get our attention as well. And so you have this formula. You've heard that it was said, and Jesus will repeat some law of, of um, and quite often the Ten Commandments, but some part of the law. And then he says, but I'm going to tell you, Jesus is, is actually kicking the standards up a notch beyond what anyone had really considered in, in that time period. First, we need to define the terms. He says anger is a problem. Anyone who is angry with his brother is guilty of murder. 
And we need to understand this is not like the you know, you hit your thumb with the hammer anger. This is not a a sudden you know you bump your head and you get a little frustrated or or you're stuck in traffic and that's you know someone cuts you off and and you know unless you're trying to run them down and kill them. It's not talking about that kind of anger. This is a a, a deep inward anger, a deep bitterness. Uh, it, you know, hate would be a proper term within this, that you actually wish someone were dead. It's, it's that kind of deep bitterness. And uh, so that's when he says, you know, anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. He's talking about, he's not talking about a, you just got angry because of one little incident and you get over it five minutes later. He's talking about, uh, about a, just a deep bitterness that's, that lasts days and days, maybe even years. And uh, if we hold that kind of bitterness against each other, that definitely destroys relationships and goes against who and what God is all about. Again, this term fool, we, we don't consider that a particularly derogatory term. Um, we don't consider it a positive one, but it's, it's a matter when when the Hebrews of the first century called someone a fool, they were talking about someone who had no sense of God, no sense of accountability, a basically a depraved being. And of course, Jesus uses this in the context of murder. He says, you've heard that don't, you shouldn't murder people. And again, this reference is saying, if you call someone a fool, you could be in dangers of the fires of hell because this is character assassination. Maybe you don't physically kill the person, but you are completely destroying their character. You're claiming that they have no knowledge of God, no awareness, they're utterly depraved. And that's not something we should be judging. Only God can judge those things. That's not our department. And so, you know, Jesus is telling us, if you start assassinating someone's character, you're going to be just as guilty as if you killed them physically. That, that in God's eyes... The both are, are equal sins. Both are, are devastating things to do, and they go against building community and building better relationships. Keeping the law is good. Jesus is, is quoting the law, and he's not saying don't keep the law. But he's, he's, uh, he's saying if, if you want to maintain a right attitude in your heart, that's the kind of righteousness that Jesus is talking about. He's saying you've got to start in the heart. And so it's not enough just to just to keep the law. It needs to be deeper. It needs to be something within that comes out of our very pores, that, that, that just saturates our thinking and our spirits. And so he's, he's, again, raising the standards of what it means to be someone of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this principle is reiterated all through Scripture. You can't... You can't read the stories of the Bible and not pick up on the relational importance of, of building community, building relationships that are, and, and the fact that our relationships with each other are directly related, intertwined, part and parcel of our relationship with God. In other words, our relationships with each other should reflect our relationship with God. And if we claim to have a close relationship with God, it should mean that we're having good, healthy relationships with those around us for as much as we can. As Paul tells us in Romans 12, live it as much as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. So before we can come to God, he talks about if you realize your brother has something wrong with you, leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile and then come back and pick up your gift. He's He's saying you can't really worship God if there's a conflict, if there's a, a disruption to your relationship with your brother. You need to make peace with your brother before you appear before God to worship with a clean heart, a pure spirit, that the two are intricately connected. And we need to never forget that. And I think we understand that if you understand the two greatest commands are to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That, that those two are, those aren't really two separate laws. It's, it, they're connected. And we need to understand that the relational nature of who God is and what he's all about should be reflected in his people, his followers, his disciples. Then we get to this other one that uh, quite often makes us feel a little uncomfortable, challenging. It says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman 
lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. Now, everyone knew that, you know, do not commit adultery was part of the law of Moses. But again, Jesus is, is kicking this up a notch. If you just look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. That, that as far as the sin scale goes, they're both the same before God. Both are sins before God. Now, the tricky part here is we have to define lustfully because I think there's a lot of confusion about this. Any, you know, any teenager who reads this verse feels automatically condemned. We're all, you know, we're filled with hormones and you're going through those kinds of things. Even men through later life can't help but notice attractive women. And, and in this day and age, uh, a lot of women are getting addicted to pornography just like men are. So we need to understand what are we talking about here when we say when when Jesus says look at a woman lustfully, what's he talking about? Because it's and we don't like to define it, but we really need to if we're going to understand what he's telling us here. And the best definition I've ever come up with is basically you would if you could. You see, when he says lustfully, he's not saying you recognize that a woman is attractive, or maybe vice versa, a man is attractive uh, for women. He, he's not talking about just sort of seeing uh, the beauty of God's creation uh, in, in our anatomies, uh, even recognizing that, that someone may be a little sexy. I don't think crosses the line of lustful. Um, this idea of lustful is you're looking with the intent of doing if you could, that, that you've sort of already made up your mind and your heart, and that's getting to the heart of what Jesus is talking about here, uh, that, it, that, it, that the sin takes place in the heart first before it ever comes out in the external world. Now, one of the things you need to consider is, where is the sin? When someone lusts after someone else, and again, that's male to female or female to male, when someone lusts after someone else, who is being sinned against? And I ask that question because quite often, if a man looks at a woman and recognizes she's really hot, most of the women appreciate that. Most women actually want to be noticed for being attractive. And most men would feel the same way. They would want to be recognized as being good looking. And they would not consider being, the, oh, if someone recognizes I'm attractive or handsome or beautiful, uh, most of us would not consider that a sin against ourselves in that sense. Now, yes, there are leering looks and men who are, I've seen both men and women, you know, express themselves in a way that clearly tells you they're, they're looking lustfully. But the fact is, and again, I... I recognize this as a father. I have a very beautiful daughter. Um, and I remember walking through malls and public places with my daughter. And I recognize the looks that people were giving her, especially uh, other young men who were her age and even older men. And, and you could tell if they were saying, wow, she's attractive. And there's another look that uh, tells a father they're looking a little further than they should be. And again, I recognize my daughter appreciated being noticed for being attractive. She didn't feel sinned against. But as a father, knowing what those looks mean, I was being sinned against. I realized they were looking at her like she's a piece of meat, like just something to be had and tossed, as to fulfill some sort of short-term appetite or desire. I felt highly offended. And I was always fascinated when I would see them looking at her, and then I would see them notice me next to them, staring at them. And suddenly they averted their eyes entirely. We need to understand. You see, God is a father, too. He's one of the greatest fathers ever, because he is God. And he feels about us the same way I felt about my daughter, and still do. He doesn't like other people looking at us like we're pieces of meat, like we're something to be devoured and tossed, some temporary fulfilling of an appetite. 
Um, so we need to understand when, when he's talking about lust here, God is the one who is being offended. Whenever, whenever we look at God's creatures and somehow subhumanize them to just objects to be played with and tossed, God is the one who is being sinned against. Now, when Jesus talks about cutting out your eye and, and cutting off your right hand, these are, these are again, metaphorical statements and not to be taken literally. And uh, we need to understand that what he's really trying to say is that you need to take some pretty radical action to adjust your behavior and avoid falling into sin or a sin pattern. That, uh, that he uses these rather harsh statements to shock his audience to get their attention, to say, look, sin is serious, sin is self-destructive, sin is damaging to the community. And that's not who the people of God are all about. That, that's not what God is all about. And so he's saying, if you find yourself sliding into one of these sin patterns in your heart, you need to take some radical action to change that thinking, to change the way you view other people, recognizing that they are God's creatures just like you. He's clearly locating the origin of sin in the heart, not in the external action. Very rarely do any of us, you know, your hand just reaches out and does something without the brain or some sort of inner Thing, you know, other than reflex action, there's something within us that tells us to act. And Jesus is getting past the physical act, and he's going right to the source of the problem, the heart. If we've given our hearts to God, if we're letting God's Spirit fill our hearts, letting the Holy Spirit transform us, we will quit thinking like merely human beings, and we will start thinking and acting then as the people of God, the people of of the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus is trying to get us to understand what God is looking for in people who claim to be the people of the kingdom of heaven. You see, if we claim to be God's children, we need to reflect God's character in our lives. And that's what Jesus is talking about throughout this section. Submitting to external observations of the law is just not enough. Just checking the box is not enough. That's not a relationship. It, it has to go deeper than that. The holiness and righteousness that is required by God starts in our heart, starts in, the, in, in a complete change of how we view the world around us, that we must view it with God's eyes and not human eyes. One of the things you need to know about bitterness is that it poisons every relationship you have. You may hate that particular person, or you may hate that particular coworker or boss, but when you start hating, when you start harboring the bitterness, it poisons all of your other relationships. And one of the things that bitterness does is it actually makes us look at someone else as if they are subhuman. We actually assassinate their character way before we get to unleashing any bitterness. One of the things that's fascinated me, too, is when I've talked to people about bitterness, quite often, the person they're bitter against doesn't even know, is unaware that they hate them so much. And so the only person being negatively affected by the bitterness is the person who is bitter. And they are actually becoming bitter towards everyone even though they're trying to focus their bitterness on one person. It poisons every other relationship you have. And therefore, that's why the Bible talks about don't, don't let the sun go down on your hanger, uh, lest you give Satan a foothold in your life. This is bitterness. If you're filled with bitterness, that is a gift from Satan. That is not a gift from God. And, and, and bitterness will blind even your ability to have a good relationship with God. And so that's why the Bible is so hard on anger, promotes anger management, and is very anti-bitter or hatred, because that just destroys your own spirit, your own heart, and your own relationships in the process. It creates the subhuman category. It actually, it, it, it takes a creature of God and starts treating them like they're just some sort of animal to be abused. 
And God finds that very unacceptable. Anytime anyone takes, looks at one of his creatures that he created and, and subhumanizes them in some way, uh, that's just unacceptable to God. And we need to understand, see, bitterness reduces a person's character. It makes them subhuman. Lust reduces the person, too. A creature created in God's image is reduced to a piece of meat. How do you think, uh, how do you think God feels about that? Well, the Bible's pretty clear. God finds this highly offensive. And if I ever give you any piece of advice that you really need to listen to, it's just a good idea not to offend the creator of the universe. He is the all-powerful God. We need to be children seeking to please him. We need to be children that God can be proud of, not that God will be offended by. And so we need to listen to these words of Jesus very, very carefully. What's our call to action in this section? Well, again, I'm going to continue to remind you, Jesus is expounding on his statement, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We need to pay attention. Because what he's saying is, is our righteousness needs to exceed theirs if we hope to enter the kingdom of heaven, if we hope to represent the kingdom of heaven in our lives. We're called to be holy. We're called to be to live by a higher standard, a higher code of conduct, a higher form of thinking. A touch of the divine mixed with our humanity. And that's what we're called to do. And we're called to do that because of God's main mission here on earth. Only then will the world see God in us. If we're not going to live by a higher standard, if we're going to look like everybody else, if we're just going to blend in, God will not be glorified. But if we do become pure in heart, if we do become one of those blessed things that Jesus talks about at the opening of this, this section of teaching, if we do live to a higher standard, if, we, if we're transformed in our heart and it just comes out in our pores, it comes out in our actions, it comes out in our words, that's when people will see God is in us. And that's when people will recognize these people are doing great things, not because they're great, but because the God within them is great. And that's what we're called to do. That is God's mission on earth, is to draw the world, those who don't know him, out of darkness and into his wonderful light. I pray you'll take that message and that thought with you this week and throughout the rest of your lives, to live in such a way that God is seen in you. That's what every Christian hopes for. Thank you for joining me today.